Uau! Uau! Oh! <laughs> it's like looking into the gates of hell. Science sometimes get interesting. This is what a real research looks like. You see, for some time, I've been kicking around this idea of using sodium to counteract global warming, either as a carbon neutral fuel or as a fuel additive that produces enough cooling aerosols to counteract global warming. That's not just blowing smoke, because there's something else about these reactions that no one seems to have noticed, and something that shouldn't be there. You get these dense aerosol. Ballpark figures, the Earth gets about a, a thousand watts of energy from the sun per square meter. All of global warming is only about one part in a thousand extra heating. In more detail, it's two parts in a thousand extra heating from the greenhouse gases, and about one part in a thousand cooling from the aerosols. So if you could actually make it two parts in a thousand cooling from the aerosols, you could probably buy yourself a grace period of decades to get your act together on not burning as much fossil fuels. Now there's a problem here, of course. Sodium is pretty evil stuff, most notably in how it explodes in water. In terms of energy density, it's actually lower than gasoline. And of course, sodium is also a solid, which is actually one of the things that concerns me the least in that it melts at about 100 degrees Celsius. <laughs> and seeing as all heat engines produce a crazy amount of waste heat, eh, that, that's just never going to be a problem. However, for me, working in the lab, I want the convenience of working on a liquid metal at room temperature. And it turns out if you get sodium and potassium and mix them together, you get a liquid called sodium potassium alloy which is what I'm going to be using in these experiments. Now, my early attempts used ultrasound to nebulize that alloy, and while they were kind of successful, the problem was that the metal short-circuited the ultrasonic misters, and in some cases also kind of melted them. Oh, wow. Okay, that's not bad. So today, we're going back into the lab to see if, of all things, you can use a standard fuel injector uh, from a car to actually nebulize and burn sodium potassium alloy. I'm not even kidding either. I mean, this is pure hellscape stuff. A few hours earlier. So it all goes around this remarkable little contraption here, who is actually a fuel injector of a car, being kind of modified by me, just a little bit. Um, now, I didn't know this before I started. This was a suggestion from one of my patrons, uh, Sly Fox. Spy Fox? Uh, anyway, uh, so he suggested using fuel injectors to burn sodium. And I didn't know a lot about fuel injectors. I knew they worked at fairly high pressure. In fact, um, Smarter Every Day has recently put a video up about them um, well, he didn't quite mention that when he's testing them, he's putting like massively more fuel through them than they would actually burn in reality. But anyway, uh, so I didn't know anything about this when I started, which is now um, about two days ago. It's been the learning curve. So I got myself a fuel injector and some pressurization kit without really realizing that there are two types of fuel injectors in this world. There are the low pressure ones, which run at a few atmospheres, and the high pressure ones, which direct, inject directly into the cylinder that run at hundreds of atmospheres. This is my pressurization line for my fuel injector. This is actually currently pressured at about five atmospheres of pressure, five bar. So if I open this up, that's about five atmospheres, which I can just about hold with one finger without really making a lot of effort. And it, it, it comes out quite fast, but you know, I, I can hold it with a finger, no problem. I can hold up to about 10 bar with a finger. But let's, let's, let's close him off. There we go. So that's the pressure that I'm going to be using to pressurize my fuel injector. So the other ones, they run up to like hundreds of atmospheres. And for those, you need a big uh, bass pressurization thing. And also the fuel injectors are much more expensive. So these, they're only about 20 bucks, 20 euros, that sort of thing. You'll see there's three little holes in there. 
and the rest of it is a solenoid, right? It's just a regular solenoid. You put voltage over these things, you can open and close the valve fairly quickly, which is what it's doing with your engine, you know. So every time you want to inject fuel in, you open the valve up for milliseconds, very short period of time. The testing kit that I've got turns out is for more just checking that the flows are good. So it puts through a lot more fuel than you would regularly put through in your engine. Now there's a load of rules about lab safety, which usually revolve around don't burn the building down and um, try not to kill yourself. Yeah, these, these are general etiquettes in most labs. So if you're going to do something dangerous, like say for instance, burning stuff, uh, one of the safest ways to do it is just to limit the amount of stuff that you have in there. So I'm going to do that by limiting the amount of fuel that I have in the system to a few mils. And the reason I'm doing that way is because then that's the worst thing that can possibly go wrong. So here I have an ignition source. And here I have a syringe with ethanol, which is going to be one of the first solvents we're going to test with. And here one with pentane, which is very similar to gasoline in terms of chemical composition, which is the second fuel that we're going to test with. And then we're going to move up to sodium potassium alloy, which might do all sorts of crazy stuff. The, um, yeah, it might be a problem. So in terms of energy density, gasoline is the lowest energy density of all of them. And I'm, I'm going to turn the lights off for this one so you have a better chance of actually seeing what the hell's going on. So, you know, this is a milliliter of gasoline who burns with a sort of bluish flame. Yeah, so th this is the, the absolute worst case scenario that you're going to get with the gasoline. Not with the gasoline, with the um, ethanol. Um, and then if we do that again with pentane, he's a little more spicy, right? But fundamentally, oh look, they were little snakes. There's a limit, yeah, the most important thing of course is you keep the solvent bottles away. That's what one milliliter looks like. Incidentally, one milliliter of gasoline will run your car for roughly 20 meters. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a few mils in here I know from my tester that when I put a little spasm on here, it'll inject about a milliliter out of the fuel nozzle. Of course, it comes out as a spray and it's going to release roughly all of that amount of heat in a fraction of a second, which is obviously going to be a fairly decent sized fireball. But I need to characterize that. So I need to know on the end of there, you will see. OK, so there you go. You might just about be able to see three little holes on there. Those are the three holes that our stuff's going to come out of. So we have these things. Uh, they're polyethylene, um, polypropylene, something like that. Uh, they're, they're used for columns. They will take pressures up to 10 atmospheres, which is very nice. And they have these standard syringe fittings called lure lock. It's also very useful. So I've improvised one of those on there with a very, very good seal on this end. <laughs> that's, that's probably never coming off again unless I sort of cut it off. So you've got to really know your materials to play games like this, right? Just, just, just burning the regular solvents, that's not really that much of a problem. In the, eh, they're all kind of a much of a muchness. However, when you come onto sodium potassium alloy, that is a completely different beastie. In the, if you use the wrong plastic with sodium potassium alloy, yes, I have already bled for this experiment. If you use sodium potassium alloy in the wrong plastic, it will just spontaneously burst into flames and very violently as well. So, right, first of all, all what we can do is we can pressurize this up and we're going to start with ethanol. And we, right, there's a staging that's involved here when you're doing dangerous stuff. The first thing is, what does it look like? normally, then what's it look like with fire, and then ultimately, what's it going to look like when we get sodium potassium alloy injected through one of these guys. Cool, All right, so let's get going. Right, so here's my little driver for testing the, the valve up there, and I can do it in various modes. So I can have a short pulse, or I can how about the, you hear that buzzing? That's the, which I'm not sure you will be able to hear it. Now I'm going to move the microphone over to this and hopefully 
And while it's doing that, it's opening and closing very quickly. So next, we need to be able to pressurize this. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to inject some ethanol into my system, like so. Okay, that works. And I've got built up pressure on there, so just relieve that. Good. There is about five atmospheres of pressure on the top line here. Now when I hit the pulse button, most of that spray just makes it straight down to the bottom then as a big puddle. I'm going to tear it at zero, give it a pulse like this. And we're going to weigh what? See what that weighs. And it weighs less than a gram, 0.7 grams. So it's about a milliliter. And just so we're clear at roughly what this is going to look like when we get to the fuel injection stage. So this, bear in mind, is ethanol, which is about half the energy density of gasoline. So, um, okay, let's give this a go. So it's quite impressive and it's sort of containable and safe. The maximum amount of volume that we've got in there is a couple of mils. And uh, before we move on to sticking sodium potassium alloy in there, uh, which is going to be exciting, there's a reasonable chance this all just crashes and burns when we come to sodium potassium alloy. There's also a very reasonable chance that it's a fantastic success. This is leaking, I can hear it leaking. So this is the problem that I had last time, is with certain solvents it tends to leak more than others. And I never really figured out why. So it's, it's a learning experience with these, with these valves. So what I'm going to do, first of all, is get a high speed camera on this. And I'm just going to try with three solvents, with water, with ethanol, and with pentane, to get a rough idea of what these jets look like when they're coming out for which we will need the high-speed camera. Good, I got a fairly solid tripod. Mm, fairly expensive camera. Yeah, we've got decent balance on that. So in the first instance, I just need a fairly narrow angle shot, which means I've got to get lots of light on this thing so that I can see what's going on. The regular lights they've got in here, complete waste of time for this sort of high-speed photography. In that, first of all, these are fluorescents. They pulse at 50 hertz, which is a hell of annoying strobe when you get on the high-speed camera. So you need a continuous light source. And I've never really come across anything better than just these regular high-powered torches, which, um, uh, yeah, it, it, it gets really quite hot uh, for the sample here. And... Right. There you go, boom. And we trigger it. Now we'll be able to work out from the number of frames between actually seeing stuff how quick the pulses are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Eighteen frames. Yeah, give or take twenty. 20 milliseconds. 20 milliseconds between pulses, and the pulses are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So it's roughly 20 milliseconds between the pulses and 10 milliseconds for the pulse itself, I think. Okay, so that was ethanol. I'm going to try next with pentane, which is essentially gasoline. And. And it's much more spray-like. So surface tension clearly has quite a big impact on this, which turns out it's going to be really important when we come to the sodium potassium alloy, because sodium potassium alloy surface tension is much more akin to water than it is to pentane. Okay, so we have some sort of partial blockage on the nozzles. So previously when I've had this, I flushed a load of cleaning liquid through it, which basically detergent and water, and that seemed to do the job. So I'm going to do that again, see if that sorts my problem out. Right, let's see what this does for us. Oh, there you go. 
<laughs> Instant unclogging. We're back. So this is just like really quite a powerful detergent and water. Pulses, that's nice. Oh God, they're hugely different, damn. So what do they all look like side by side? So here we're filming at a thousand frames per second. In the first instance, there's clearly a drop on the end of the nozzle that takes a few jets to actually sort itself out. But it does give you an interesting barometer of having a particle in freefall on the actual image. And you can see as a general rule, the water and the ethanol, the ones with the higher surface tension, they give straight jets. And then the pentane and the toluene give more spray-like jets with definitely better aerosolization coming on the latter two. I also filmed this at 20,000 frames per second. So it's the same deal as before, 10 milliseconds of spray followed by 20 milliseconds of nothing. But again, you can see that the nebulization, the size of the particles is significantly bigger for the water and for the ethanol than it is for the pentane and the toluene. Interesting to know. So how do they respond to fire? Let's go for 2000 frames per second. Um, okay, now I could credibly believe we would see something. Right, so a lot of the high-speed camera stuff is all about can you get enough light off the object, and the flames that we're probably going to be looking here aren't particularly bright. Well, not with ethanol anyway, so putting more light onto a flame doesn't actually make the flame any brighter. Now, we're not going to see anything with that, because the flame is much further down, much, much further down. Oh no, you do get the tail, you do get the tail end of the flame. Oh, that's quite fun. <laughs> so you get multiple pulses going into the flame. The film speed is probably about right. 2000 frames per second is probably about right for this. Right, so I'm gonna have to back the camera off a lot to, uh, to be able to see the whole uh, flame. This is going to be tricky. I need the camera where you are. And this boy wants to come about twice as far away. Um. <laughs> oh, that's so cute. That is so cute. Oh, my flame is going downwards. And for the commentary track for the ethanol burning, the first spray comes down and the second one, and there is the slightest hint of a blue flame there, but it's a long way down. And you see that with every successive jet, the flame actually continues going downwards, but it's, it looks a little weird. You're used to flames burning upwards, but here the actual momentum of the ethanol spray and the air that it takes with it makes the flame go downwards. So between the different uh, vapor pressures, the different surface tensions, and the fact that pentane has about twice the energy density of ethanol, this might be a little more interesting. Now we see if a factor of two in energy density is enough to melt my laptop. That is a little more interesting. Oh, <laughs> I think we might have a little too much light on this one. Oh my God, that is awesome. This is why I'm doing all these baseline experiments because I need to know roughly how much light's gonna come off this thing and roughly what settings I do. Because when I use this with sodium potassium alloy, there's a very good chance that the valve is gonna die. Uh, <laughs> oh, man, that is so cool. Uh, the, you see the, the, oh, Jesus. Right, so. Oh, that is gorgeous. There is a blue flame break right up for the Starcraft fans out there. Oh, oh my word. It's a little overblown by that point. Okay. Uh, right, so 
This is actually an interesting one. There's, there's too much, the, at the beginning there's not enough light, and at the end there's too much light. So my reckoning is that to get it good for the end, we need almost one tenth of the light, I think. It's, uh, I'm going to stop this down such that it's much darker, about there somewhere. So what I've done on this is I've stopped down the lens. So on the right hand side, it's not letting in anywhere near as much light. So the first thing you notice is the spray on the full lit one is very bright, whereas on the stop down version, it's much harder to see the spray. And the blue flame, which is actually fairly dim, is actually shows up much better when the iris is fully open than when you've stopped it down and you're restricting the light that goes into the lens. And then later on, you get to this point where the, the orange flame is overexposed. It's burned out when the aperture is fully open, but when it's stopped down, you get the glorious flame structure. Okay, so a little break later, we're ready to try again. So first of all, we tried ethanol, which is a sort of polite, nice little blue flame. Barely see it when you're burning it down below. Then you go on to pentane, which is kind of, um, this is getting a little more exciting. Then you get on to things like toluene, which is angry dragon fire. So this, the, the reason I want to do toluene, yeah, the reason it's very bright is because you get a lot of soot particles in there and they, they make the flame a lot brighter. The thing is that when we burn the sodium, it's very likely to be similar to that. So I need to do it to get the exposure about right. In terms of energy density, toluene and, pen, and um, pentane, octane, gas, they're basically the same. The only difference is one has a lot more soot particles in it, which is light. Well, it will. It'll make the flame a lot brighter and it looks a lot angrier. You get a lot of that radiative heat coming off it. A few mils of toluene. Show me. Angry dragon fire. That's not angry dragon fire. That's a blocked nozzle. That's, that's a, a very blocked nozzle. Uh, that's not how this is meant to happen. Show me angry dragon fire. Yeah, that works. Good, good. And you see the soot coming off the flame there. Excellent. <laughs> Lots of little soot particles in the fume cupboard, which is why we do it in the fume cupboard, because that's evil polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Pretty nasty stuff. Oh, it takes a while to get going. But the flame is bright. Damn. Oh, that's gorgeous. <laughs> that's outstanding. Oh, it's fireworks. Oh, Jesus. How is that even possible? Right, I've got to get this saved. I want to do another, I want to do another one. I want to do another shot on this with it stopped down even more such that I can see the real bright burny bits. Oh, that is gorgeous. But the next one, I'm going to stop it down even more to see if we can, we can get some better views of that really bright stuff. Because that bright stuff, I suspect, is going to be similar to our sodium potassium flame if we can get it. So we'll see. We'll see. So I'm going down about a long way in light level. Okay. So we go capture pressurize, flame on, trigger. All right, because when I get to do this with the sodium potassium alloy, I'm only gonna get like one shot of it. Probably, probably. So, and I won't need the igniter. When I come for the sodium potassium alloy, it'll ignite on its own. So. Pressurize, pulse, trigger, done. So that's hopefully what it's gonna go like. Oh, <laughs> it's like looking into the gates of hell. I'm not even kidding either. I mean, this is pure hellscape stuff.
So one last thing I really need to avoid this with the sodium is a decent face mask. Because I don't want my face melted off. It shouldn't, you know, I expect it to be more like the, um, the Tollyween, but there is still the scope for things to go wrong. And you get a mouthful of sodium. Uh, yeah, you need something like this. <laughs> That's about right. Yeah, that'll work. That's good. Okay, that looks good for sodium potassium alloy. I think I might skip the pre-filter for this. The chances are I'm going to destroy the valve in a very comprehensive manner anyway. And I'm probably going to try and cover my arms with something as well. Fleece should be fine. It's something you can just take off quickly. Okay, so I'm going to want about two moles of sodium potassium alloy. That's fantastic. So there's my alloy. I'll show you that in a second. That is my sodium potassium alloy. You can focus on that. And you see there's a bit of uh, pentane in there already, or something. Yeah, he's pretty, isn't he? <sighs> so, and he's got a skin on him. Mm, my computer also might get a little singed here. Between this. A face mask, I should be good. There's also the potential for the unexpected that it sort of just goes pop and stuff goes everywhere. Uh, normally I would just have the glass shield between me and this, but I need the good filming for the camera. Uh, there's still a limit of what they can go wrong. What can go wrong with the burning sodium is not that different from what can go wrong with the burning gasoline. Um, so in terms of energy density, it's comparable to ethanol. Um, but I've got some filters in here and I'm not so sure it's going to directly push through the filters. Mm, it's a low lock coming off on that. Oh, it's not too bad. Okay. Oh, a little bit of fire there. Okay, we are primed and ready to go. This is where things get a little bit more exciting. A little more exciting. Right. Sequencing. We have the camera. Camera's focus should still be good. I'm not doing any ignition on this. So we just need to hit trigger and we need to pressurize, pressurize, trigger, trigger. Okay, let's see what we can do here. This might go wrong almost immediately. We'll see how it goes. Pressurize, pressurize. Trigger. Trigger. Well, it didn't even catch fire, it just sprayed out. Huh. Right, let's depressurize. We might get another shot at this. It <laughs> absolutely diddly squat. It is a little sodium heavy, it must be said, but even at that. And you can barely see anything. So I'm not even going to record that because I want to get moving on the next one. Right, so let's go back to live. Uh, let's go to record. And this time I'm going to give it an ignition source. Okay. Let's check that we're live. Yep, we're live. That's good. Right. So. Pressurize. Trigger, trigger. Pressurize. Trigger. Trigger. 
Now that is a whole bunch of utter non-event. <laughs> Not what I was expecting at all. So I've done this with other stuff. Uh, so it's obviously not nebulizing anywhere near as you would want it to. Uh, okay, well, let's see what it actually looks like on the... Uh, on the playback. So at that point, I'm going to flush the rest through. And let's brighten this all the way up and see if we actually record something. Right, let's do this one last time. We are still pressurized, okay. Yeah, let's capture. Right, we're ready to trigger. Let's do it. Let's give them an ignition source as well. Ah, that's a little better. <laughs> well, um, okay. That's a little better. Oh, that's exactly what I'm after. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes. Oh, wow. Wow. If you get the aerosolization right, it's not bad. Oh, yeah, if you get the aerosolization right, it's good. Oh, and I was right about the, right, so this is way too bright. This is fantastic for the smoke. So at the start, we've got a drop of sodium potassium alloy on the end of our fuel injector, which comes off as a sort of blob. But the next spurt actually sort of bounces and ricochets off that. And you see all the little smoky bits, that's from a sort of partial combustion. And then later on, we, we're getting some sparks and eventually it does actually sort of, um, yeah, boom, you yeah, get the real combustion. And you know it's real combustion because of that big white cloud. And like I was saying, that white smoke there has some really quite interesting properties with respect to aerosols. And that's the bit that I'm really interested in. Now, I've got to be honest, I didn't go over the design specs of this fuel injector before using it, but I'm I'm pretty certain that injecting sodium potassium alloy through it is outside of its design specs. Nonetheless, it looks like you can. Yeah, I mean, this obviously isn't the ideal thing, but it's conceptually possible to use things like fuel injectors with sodium potassium alloy. However, one of the significant downsides of doing experiments like this is the cleanup is kind of nasty. This kind of nasty. So the thing is, I've got to make all this safe and clean. And the easiest way to do that is to probably flush a mixture of pentane with a small amount of ethanol through the valve. That's the thing that has the best chance of not destroying the valve. Um, so my reckoning would be, uh, this will probably catch fire spontaneously as well, but we'll see. Um, we need something that is mostly pentane. If I go too heavy on the ethanol, it'll just make um, an ethoxide, which will precipitate and block the valve. Yeah, I need to do it much more gently. So what I need is something that's about um, uh, only a few percent ethanol. Now we start. Okay, that's not bad. It's a good start. So what I'll do is the first time you flush it through, you don't want a lot of uh, ethanol in there. And as you flush it through, you want progressively more ethanol. So this time I go for significantly more ethanol. It's like going to be about a 20% ethanol solution. Right, pressurize. And do we have fire? No, nope, but it's flushing. I've not destroyed the valve, which the valve actually looks like it's in pretty good shape. I didn't destroy the valve! <laughs> the thing that I was most worried about. 
Right, so now I'm going to flush through with pure ethanol. Okay, and again, let's not get too cavalier. I'm keeping the face mask until I've flushed it through with pure ethanol. At that point, I'm sort of, once you've flushed it through with pure ethanol, you can rest a little easier. And the, the first stuff, it's sodium potassium alloy. So it's always very reactive at the start when you're reacting away the potassium and then progressively it gets weaker and weaker as you react away the potassium. <sighs> Kill! <laughs> it worked! You do need ignition for the sodium. Holy crap though. Oh! <laughs> oh, that's gorgeous. Okay, super. Right, so now to clean all this up without actually killing myself or burning the lab down. So we have sodium potassium alloy to get rid of here. Let's get my computer out of the way. It looks like it survived for another day, which is good. I have one of the, all these, all the, the dents, they're, they're, they're something different, but all the bits where you're missing paint that's where it's been sprayed with sodium potassium alloy at one point or another. This laptop's seen some service. Right, so the easiest way to make sure that you've not got sodium potassium alloy over everything is you just basically soak it in the sink. You spray water over everything. There's a bit much of it there. So there's your sodium potassium alloy. And just to give you an idea of what this stuff will usually do, so I'm just gonna touch it with a wet rag. So this is just water and you'll get all sorts. This is what you always see in the sink, um, is you just get sparks and little bits of fire everywhere. Have you enjoyed watching a poor pedestrian Ford Fiesta low pressure fuel injection valve being subjected to a repurposing that no other Ford Fiesta fuel injection valve has ever been subjected to? Give the plucky little fella a thumbs up. And a big thanks to all those who support this channel on Patreon and keep it free of annoying Rage, Shadow League, whatever promotions. And of course, allow me to get all the fancy kit to make this video. Cari